they have their questions. Hi, Roy. Thoughts on uh, Toro Mata? Well, Toro Mata is a gigantic subject, and I haven't studied it deeply. Um, one thought that I have is that Torah and X has to be taken with great care because the normal, the normal attitude, I was saying this afternoon, sure, is that Torah incorporates everything that's of value, of interest, of importance. So if you're going to say Torah and X, you have to have some special explanation as to why X somehow being listed separately from Torah. Now, the Mada is a wonderfully vague term, which could mean at least 16 different things. In modern Hebrew, it means science. In <coughs> etymologically, it means knowledge. But then there are different words for knowledge in Hebrew, like Chachma and Bina, and Haskel and others. So uh, it, it could cover a way, very great range. The dangerous idea, I think, is that, your, that the Torah doesn't give you a complete picture of everything that is necessary to know to serve God. And, that, and then the implication is, well, the other things that are necessary to serve God must be as important as Torah. So then you really have two different subjects of equal importance. What could be more important than knowing how to serve God? So uh, I think that's an idea which should not be accepted. Yes, in order to know whether you should fast on Yom Kippur, you have to go to the doctor who knows medical, who knows medicine, and everything else. That's not the same as the mitzvahs of Yom Kippur. I'm on a par with the mitzvahs of Yom Kippur. You know? The architect's plans and the shovel with which you dig the ground aren't equal, even if you do need both of them. So uh, I think that uh, it, it's, uh, it, like many other terms, like Zionism. Zionism means something different to everybody who uses the term. So I don't think you should ask for the definition of the term. In a particular context, you should ask, what does this person mean when he says it? And looking for an, a definition of the term won't be helpful for communication. When it comes to philosophy, is there anything specific you would add? Add to what? Uh, to the, I mean, add to the, the answer. Specific to Torah, in regards to philosophy. Again, I don't know what a person means when he puts the vav there. What does he mean? They're equal. One helps the other. You're not complete without both of them. What does he mean when he puts the vav there? There are many different things he could mean by putting the vav there. Each one will get a different treatment. I, I'm not, I, I'm, I just said that I'm against trying to, dis, to you know, we have uh, in philosophy there, uh, the types and tokens, right? There's a sequence of words in the language. And there's people who speak the words. Very often, even the meaning of a speech is not determined by the meanings of the words. For example, take the three words in English, I am rich. Now take them as a sequence of words in the, in the, langu in the language. I doesn't refer to anything. It doesn't refer to anything. It's just a referring, uh, it's called an indexical term. It refers to whoever's speaking. And right now there's no one speaking. You're talking abstractly. I am rich. I have three words in the language. That doesn't have any truth value. So what should I tell you about it? When the person speaks it, he's referring to himself and saying that he's rich. That's what you really want to know. All you get from the semantics is the instructions, how to get the meaning in what he says. Well, until someone says it, it doesn't, it doesn't have a meaning. In context, it makes a big difference. Like... Uh, in, in English, you have a double negative. When you say no twice, it comes out to mean yes. There was a philosopher who was speaking at Columbia, and he said, that's true in English. You have a double negative that can mean a positive. But there's no other thing as a double positive that means a negative. And Sidney Workinbesser from the back of the room said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is a double positive, which means a negative, right? means he's disagreeing. Yeah, yeah. But you have to say it with that, with that, uh, with that tone of voice. Because if you said, yeah, yeah, that wouldn't have been a negative. So you know, I don't think there's any purpose in trying to define three words in the language when each person who speaks it's going to mean something different by it. I don't think it's useful to do that.
the most misleading. If I give it a definition, somebody else says something different, he'll say, well, you're wrong, because Khatib says that's what the words mean, so that's what you have to mean. But isn't that, isn't that it isn't true for these types of words? Also, just to clarify, the things the Torah gives us in order to have a complete picture of how to serve God, are those only halacha, or there's other things as well? I guess that depends upon how, how broadly you, pres- you, you describe halacha. Of course, halacha comes the word lalechas, which means to walk. It's, these are ways to walk. If I take it that way, no, it's all halacha. It's all walking to yeah, have a relationship with God. But if you talk about strict uh, question of, of commandments, uh, rules for action, and that's subcategory of commandments. Not all commandments are rules for action. Even that's not obvious, but there are some commandments which are simply statements of procedural fact. This is the way in which you divorce a woman. Nobody told you to divorce her. This is the way in which you divorce a woman. If you do it this way, she's divorced. If not, not. Taharas Kalim, if you want to purify the Kli, this is how you do it. You don't have to. You leave it to me. Nobody told you to, clar- to, to purify it. So there are lots of mitzvahs, the Minchas makes this point, which are only procedural. But if you're talking about rules for action or legal procedures, then there's much more than that, surely. There are, there are values, there are, uh, um, how shall I say, inspirations for development in a certain way which aren't reduced to strict laws, and there are real rules why they aren't. As far as Israel says, you can't have laws for mitos because they're too various and too, too dep- context-dependent. So you can only say, we want you to grow in this direction, but we can't tell you when and how and why and how and what, and what measure. So uh, there, there is a lot, a lot more to that. I mean, Torah contains poetry. Torah contains inspiration. Torah contains lots, lots of things. It's not just uh, halacha, in the narrow sense of halacha. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, wanted to ask uh, about when Jewish people were given the first uh, two pronouncements. Uh, we learned that they died. So I, I wanted to ask, like, uh, do we know uh, how, well, of course we know, but uh, the rabbis explain how was the period through which they came back to life and how, how that... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't, the procedure was there. I mean, God brought them back to life. Whether he used tal or whatever it was, I don't know about it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it. But I think it's, it is, there is a deep idea here, part of which I'm taking from the Maharal, the first word of the Ten Pronouncements at Sinai, as you know, I don't say Ten Commandments because there are like 15 commandments there, so it's just not, just not accurate. The first word is I. Mm-hmm. Now, in, the, in, in Biblical Hebrew, there are two words for I. One is Anochi and one is Ani. The um, Ksav Kabbalah explains the difference between them. If someone says, I am a baker, there might be two ways to understand what he's saying. He might be saying, I'm a baker, not an accountant, and not a, not a bus driver, and uh, not a lawyer. I'm a baker. There are the emphasis is on the predicate. I'm a baker and not something else rather than baker. Another thing you might mean is, I am a baker. And there the conscious is, I, not Ruve, not Shimon, not Levy. No, they're not bakers. I'm a baker. The other conscious is I and not someone else. When the conscious, when the emphasis on baker is a baker and not something else. Now, Ani in Hebrew, the emphasis is on the predicate. And say, Ani, Ofe, which would be say, I'm a baker in Hebrew. That means I'm a baker and not an accountant and not a bus driver. If I say, Anochi, Ofer, then it means I am the baker and not Ruvin and not Shimon and not Levi. Kodbrochu says Anochi, I, I and not another. The emphasis is on, on not another. This is a clue as to why they die. Because when Kodbrochu says Anochi, nothing can stand up against him. Nothing can stand up independent of him. He, and only he, is real in that sense. His existence is necessary. Everything else is just a creature. It's just a product of his will. So when he asserts 
his being, nothing can stand in the way. That's why they had to die. We have at least the appearance of an independent agency. We could say yes or we could say no. That has to be obliterated. Indeed, the Rao, this is a very unpopular thing to say, and I wouldn't recommend that you share it with just everybody. It should be selective. But when God t told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, Maharal says that it should have been completed. There's no rule, no principle, no ideal which says that there can't be human sacrifice. Yes, you heard me correctly. You could play the tape back if you wanted. I'll say it again. There's no rule, no logical, no, no moral, no metaphysical rule prohibiting human sacrifice. The reason why God called it off, says the Maharal, it's because the late Sani Hador, the fools and scoffers of the generation, will say either that Abraham did it out of, out of uh, wickedness or hatred, or he, he himself was an idol worshiper, and so on and so on. But if the generation had been more worthy, it would have been carried out, because everything on the altar in the temple was destroyed. Everything was destroyed. Animals were killed. Their blood was poured out. Their bodies were burned on the altar. The wine was poured into a, into a hole, which, which, which was destroyed. The oil and the finest, finest oil and the finest flour made into patties, and they're burned on the altar. Where God places his presence, nothing can survive in that, in that context. And, the, and what they have been taught was not even human beings. So I think the idea here is, although, in other words, and if something does, it's because of Kodesh who so to speak, holds back his presence so as to leave room for other things to exist. This is a very low-level, primitive, almost trivial application of tzimtzum. Leaving room for other things to exist. But now, what, what you have at Mahmoud Sinai is, because Rogel wants to contact them as if not using his tzimtzum. He wants to contact them full force. Who, when he expresses himself full force, they die. But, you know, they, so to speak, die of the divine touch. That's contact. But you can't survive it. Okay. So I'll bring you back to that. I'll bring you back to, to life. But it's not a low-level interaction. It's not a, a, an interaction mediated by intermediaries, which tone it down, like stepping down electricity. No, it's a real contact. Just you can't manage to, 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 to live with it. That's a little bit, a little bit of what's going on there. Just a little bit. Yeah. I'm wondering how often do we hear the curse? Seven times in, tw in tw 19 years. Second question is, uh, is 19 divisible by seven? Is 19 divisible by 19 is not the prime number. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, remember, they say, that they say 19, seven out of every 19 years. Like, what does that mean? How does it, like, distribute it? Very simple. It's like you have uh, one normal year and then a leap year. Then you have two normal years and then another leap year. Then you have two normal years and then a leap year. Then you have one normal year and a leap year. When you do that, when you count them up, there are 12 normal years and seven leap years for a total of 19. One, two, two, one, two, two, one. Two. I mean, it's not exact, but, that's, because, but that, that's the idea. You, know, you skip one or, two, you have one or two normal years, and then you have a leap year. And then you skip another one or two, and then you, and you, in the end, you end up with 12, natural, 12 normal years and seven leap years were for a grand total of 12 and seven. Last time I checked, it was 19. Well, so how do you pick those? How, like, how do you pick whether it's a two-year interval or? It's, it's it alternates in, uh, in a certain pattern, and the pattern is constant. The pattern is constant throughout time. It's always the same pattern. Okay, so it's like two, two, one, two, two, one. Whatever it is, I don't, I don't know the exact pattern. What well, difference does it make? Okay, so there is a pattern. And yeah. It just resets every night. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, as Mr. Lewis, I heard someone, someone was talking, they were describing the purpose of life being to bring God's presence into the world in, in the opposite of the meaning of life. If there's a truth to it. Well, uh, there's a famous Midrash that says that, of course, God's presence was, God was present in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Chava. When they sinned, when they went out, generation after generation, God's presence went up seven levels. And then from the, from the Avos, from the patriarchs, 
down to the building of the Mishkan, came back down seven levels, and dwelt in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the in the tabernacle. Yes, of course. The <laughs> Let's put it this way. The purpose of having a physical world is not that the non-physical God should abandon it, turn his back on it, uh, show himself to be utterly distinct and, 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 and separated from it. After all, it's only his will that keeps it in existence. So he certainly has turned his back on it. So the idea is it's a vehicle for achieving a certain spiritual purpose. Now, there are different ways of describing this purpose. Amchal is clear explicitly that in the world to come, Everything will be there, even the mosquitoes. Nothing gets lost. Nothing at all. Of course, it will be all transformed into different, uh, different uh, characteristics and so forth and so on, but nothing gets lost. So yes, ultimately, the purpose is that everything in, that is, has been created should be a vehicle for God's expression, for God's presence. Yes, that certainly is, that certainly is correct. That is definitely a mainstream idea. Okay. Uh, okay. This uh, this is a good question. Um, first of all, you ask if you uh, adhere to a moon of shuta, how do you defend yourself? Who says you have to defend yourself? Show me the mitzvah to go out and defend yourself against critics. Turn your back on the critics. Pay no attention to them. You have to show me some mitzvah to defend yourself in order for this question to have internal purchase, something that the, from the Jewish point of view. But I did a study of this once, many years ago. There's a wonderful book called Aspaclaria, 30 volumes put together by a Swiss doctor on his own, from Aleph to Tuff, and every conceivable subject of what we call Machshava, Jewish philosophy. Each volume is about six to 700 pages, starting from Torah's Moshe down to the Torah of Dessler, both Talmuds, the Zohar, the Midrashim, the, the uh, Rishonim, the works of Musser, about 60 different Svarim he quotes from. And although he doesn't bring all the material in each Sefer and every subject, the scope of the work is, is gigantic. And by the way, it is now free online. Look up Aspaklari, you can get any, any, any of those subjects online. So I did a study once on Emuna. Now, this was many years ago, when it was still only in, in, in paperback. Someone had asked me the question, across the street there's a shul, and I saw at the back of the shul a whole bookcase full of tattered books. So I went over to take a look, and it was, was Aspaclaria, and there were 52 pages on Emunah from, you know, 60s forward. So I looked up Emunah Pshuta. Every source but one says the following. Emunah Pshuta means to trust the historical tradition. To trust the historical tradition, which tells me what happened. That's not faith-based in your terminology. It's not without logic. It's not without evidence. It's not without reason. It's a certain type of evidence, a certain type of reason. I have a reliable uh, historical tradition 
it goes back to a revelation, and it encompasses national experiences with great miracles and so forth and so on. And trusting that tradition is reasonable, and that's what I base my uh, my uh, my religious identification on. That is not believing it because it makes you feel good, it inspires you, and so forth and so on. I did find one source like that. I did find one source like that, a very great source, the Malbim. But as against, 25 sources the other way. So I would say that the first thing you think of, when you think of Munuk Shuta, it doesn't mean giving up reason and, 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 and uh, basing yourself on emotion. It's giving up one type of reason and basing yourself on a different type of reason. I understand the Gura, when he was comparing the Kuzari versus the Moran the the guy of the perplexed, he said, I follow the Kuzari in this and not the guy of the perplexed. The guy of the perplexed is philosophical and scientific argumentation. The Kuzari talks about the tradition. So I think that's, that's the, the crucial difference between the two. Now, people who, uh, who um, what shall I say, deliberately distance themselves from the intellectual tradition, the, the uh, philosophical tradition, um, need to know that they are running up against some pretty stiff authorities. Chavos Lavovos is famous for saying that you must know the proofs for everything. What isn't so well known is the Shlo, a German mystic, quotes the Chavos Lavovos word for word. The Maharsha, uh, Yud Zayin Amar Aleph in, in, in Brachos, says everyone has a responsibility to prove the things that, the, that, the, uh, that we know from tradition. Marshall wasn't a Spanish mystic, a Spanish philosopher. The Rambam says it uh, word for word. Rambam calls Chachma being able to prove the things that uh, we have learned uh, from Masora. Um, uh, the Mabit says the same thing. So these are mainstream, un- indisputable authorities. So then why would anybody have a... Um, a uh, Istagut, a, a reluctance to participate in this. There are two reasons. First of all, some things may be advisable in halachic terms. Some things may even be required in halachic terms and an individual person not be able to do them. Or it could even be not right for him to do them even though they're required in halachic terms because they may cost him too much. It may cost him too much personally. You have to have a... a, a as I said about the field, you have to have a hierarchy of priorities. And for some people who, um, dare I say, the vast majority of teenagers are not intellectually balanced. No, that's another statement. All of them are not intellectually balanced. Uh, and if you teach them a, a work that has questions on Amuna and answers, many of them will say, oh, these questions are terrific. Dad won't know the answers. Now I can get him. I their air answers, I don't care, I want to get him. And he'll never know how to answer these. Or my Rebbe, or that's my excuse for eating the cheeseburger. Ah, see, the Torah can't be right because of this and this, so cheeseburgers are okay. Uh, a person who's in danger of, of using the investigation in a way that's going to destroy his spirituality is better off not doing it. He's better not doing that mitzvah because he's sacrifice all those other mitzvahs. Uh, a good place to look for this is the Leif Tov is a modern Hebrew translation of the Chavos uh, Lavavos, and he doesn't translate the first char, which goes through all these proofs. And in the beginning, he brings about 20 different statements from Akronim on the, on the subject. The vast majority who are against it are against it because it's not safe. I don't know anyone who says that it's worthless and it's wrong to do. So... Um, I think that that's the, the right attitude that we have to have towards those people who are reluctant to, to get involved in it. That's their strategy for maximizing their uh, service of Hashem, but not because intrinsically it's a wrong thing to do. What, what was that statement? Uh, it's called Leiv Tov. No, no, the, the I don't know which one you want. The Leiv Tov is a translation the of the Chovos of the Chovos. The one by the Swiss. Oh, Aspaklaria. Like the Aspaklaria Mi'ira of Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? It means a lens through which you see things. It's, uh, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Um, why is 13 the age that we're considered an adult? 
Why is what? I didn't hear you. 13 sage that were considered oh. worthy of being called the adults. Yeah, and that we only refers to the boys. The girls are 12. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to des- describe the particular moment. There is a discussion in Chazal that you have to have uh, c- categories that are precise, and you, you draw a line, and from, for all we know, the, you know, it could have been 12 years, 11 months, and, th- and, th- and 29 days, and we wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. So, um, I don't know why, uh, but I don't think it's something that's on the surface. Indeed, uh, maybe I could add here what my oldest son taught me, one of the many things. Um, we say that a, a minor is not responsible for his actions, at least not in terms of an earthly court's jurisdiction, because he doesn't have da'as. Now, I told you a few moments ago that there are a lot of different words for intellectual grasp of things in Hebrew. Da'as sometimes translated as knowledge or understanding or whatever you like in English. But he says, there are a lot of clever 12-year-olds. A lot of, in fact, I just read now about a 12-year-old who graduated a community college in America. He got a bachelor's degree at 12. And he's obviously very clever. And Chemi said in the, in the as far as to talk about these matters, Das is not intellectual. Das is what connects the intellect to the emotional and the practical. And the same kid who could have mastered all of Aristotle will take drugs or get drunk and uh, will throw his money away and so forth and so on. So Das is not so much a matter of having the understanding, it's being able to use the understanding reliably to guide your action so that your actions are appropriate. And that, very few 12-year-olds have. And today we're so advanced that very, very few 20-year-olds have. But, you know, we can, we can, anyway, that's, that's one thing that I could say. But to justify the exact, uh, precise cutoff, I'm not, really, I'm not able to do that. Yeah? It's still what? You were saying that now, nowadays, not even 20 year olds sometimes will have that. Do you think that it... Like, well, I, I think it, it, I'll tell you, it varies from person to person, and the severity with which heaven judges a person is, is de- determined strictly on the basis of his capabilities. Earthly court can't do that because you can't assess the capabilities. Sometimes they compromise with it and in, in uh, non-Jewish uh, legal thinking, and I can see where they're coming from. But it's interesting, many hold that you're only liable for punishment by heaven at the age of 20. 13 is for social control of, of behavior by tangible rewards and punishments, mostly punishments, that we meted out so as to motivate a person to, to behave well. But uh, you're only responsible for, for what you're I would say everybody agrees, but many agree that it's only at the age of 20. Yeah? Um, you often hear it said, especially from somebody who's not, you know, necessarily religious, um, but you know, even, I think even a religious person can, can see where um, it can be hard to see how it is necessarily a kindness to a child to bring that child Is the idea of, of having a children while me as you know just on my own low level might not be able to know or guarantee that this is that I'm that I'm not going to bring this kid into a life where I'll have to go through a lot and suffer a lot and just deal with a lot. Um, so is it just purely a leap of faith in Hashem because Hashem said to have kids and you know, so I'm just trusting that because I trust Hashem that it's going to be good for the kid or <coughs> is there is some more or is there some you know, logic I can put to it. Or okay, you're, you're, I, if I understand you correctly, you're basing yourself on the Gemara and Erevin, and I think you're not understanding it correctly. The Gemara that says, Basil Shammai had a debate for two and a half years about the proposition, Noach lo la'odam shenivra, or lo Noach. It's Noach for a person that he was created. Ha, huh, what does Noach mean? Pleasant, relaxing, you know, um, happy, 
pleas- uh, uh, what exactly is it supposed to mean? So let's take it that his life is laid in such a way that <coughs> it's worth it. Right? I mean, he debated for two and a half years, and then after two and a half years, Beis Hill collapsed and said, Grieve Beis Shammai, Lo Noach, Lo Noach, Lo Noach, right? So it's allowed to ask the following obvious question. At the end of the creation process, it says, God saw that everything that he did, and behold, it was very good. Was God making a mistake? Are we poskening that he made a mistake? Is that what the Beis Hill and Shammai were discussing? Did God make a mistake or didn't he make a mistake? We want to know whether it's worth it or not. I know we said he, he, he said it's worth it, but maybe he's wrong. You know, and we're just trying to decide whether he's wrong or not. Probably not, right? That's probably not the Machlechus. So that's all I said as follows. Of course everything is good, and of course everything's worth it. God doesn't do things that fail. He doesn't do things that aren't worth it. The question was, can we see why it's worth it? Can we see why it's worth it? Can we see what man's capacities are, what the alternatives are, and what he does, and then judge that, yes, it was worth it? That was the question. Can we uh, verify by observation? And when they concluded the answer was no, says Rizal Salanter, there's a practical outcome from this discussion. It wasn't just a theoretical discussion. If you can see people whose lives succeed, you can see how they lived and know that they were a success, then you could be inspired by them how to develop your life positively in that direction so as to be a success in your own life. But if you can't see a success, you can't discern it, you can't define it, you can't check it by observation, then you can't use success as your guidepost how to develop your life. What's your alternative? There's some things you know that are bad, some things you know that are wrong, you could avoid those. That you could do. So it's a big difference whether you can discern it yourself or whether you can't. But that was the question. There's nothing to do at all with whether that, that child's life is worth it, that you hinted at, well, maybe there'll be a lot of suffering. Maybe, yes, but that doesn't mean it isn't worth it. I'll tell you what what (coughs) uh, Feinstein said about this. This, I guess, was in the 50s when uh, in utero testing could start to be able to be done, and you could determine the fetus, whether it had certain syndromes, like Tay-Sachs or Down syndrome or others, and of course, the purpose of that in the Goetia world was, if you have such a child, you have an abortion. So Moshe was asked about this. And he said, he said a lot of things. It's a complex halachic shayla, which I don't remember all the details of, and I couldn't uh, present to you. But he made one remark along the way. He said, you are, you're going to have an abortion. You're deciding that this fetus, born and developed, isn't worth it. Isn't worth it. For who? You mean you have enough money in your bank account to justify it? For whom? No, you're a religious person. You believe in God. You're telling me this fetus will be born, it will have a soul, that soul will have a career, it isn't worth it for that soul to have that career in this world. Are you sure? How would you know? that it wasn't worth it for the soul. Take something horrible like progeria, which is very advanced premature aging. Childhood progeria can die at the age of 20, going through all the stages of life. Well, for 13 to 20 is seven years of responsible life. And you're saying, no, 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 that's not worth it. A soul to live through that is just not worth it. Really? I think Rev. Moshe's point is quite obviously true. Not that he needs me to say it, that we are not equipped to tell whether a certain type of life is a is a career that is positive for the career of a soul in the world. So I don't think we should have to worry about whether it's worth it or isn't worth it. We wouldn't. We would have no way of knowing. Yeah. Um, why is there still studies of this that says learn? I'm sorry. What? What? Say it again. What's the source that permits us? Explicit verse in the book of Joshua. should meditate on it day and night. So in the Gemara Menachos, someone said, I want to go learn some kind of Greek information. And he was told, find, a, find some time in the day that's neither day or night. That's when you should do it. 
Okay, you got 13 and a half minutes every day, banish, <coughs> banish mushrooms, you know. If it's really night, the day, and the night, you got 13 and a half minutes a day, and then, you know, you go ahead. Right Yes, that's true, but when you have a, a um, and this, Gemara, this point is made at least a dozen, dozen times in the Gemara, and, and the answer is, of course, it was an oral uh, communication from Moses, and God did not command that it should be put it to writing over here, and this, uh, this uh, Navi uh, put it into a, uh, into a verse. Even the Ravonas are like that, that sometimes they're, they're in the verses of the, of the prophets, and we say, well, that was something the rabbis did, and it just wasn't recorded in verses uh, until until there. Then it wouldn't be one of the six from three. It, um, it wouldn't be one of the six one three. Well, that depends. Um, there are those who say that the six hundred and thirteen have to come from verses. Are, there are those who say that? I must tell you, the six thirteen is a very technical study, and in particular. You cannot draw any halachic conclusions one way or the other. For example, there may be a verse in the Torah which says do X, and according to a certain methodology, it's not counted as 1613. That doesn't mean it's not, it's not required. It's definitely required. 613 is a very special uh, idea, something that gives a general instruction, which has different ways of being applied. Lav Sheba Kolos is not counted. Doesn't mean you don't have to do all those things. You do. It's just not counted the six thirteen. The Rambam likens it to trunks and branches. He says there are six hundred and thirteen trunks, and then there are lots and lots of branches that aren't part of the six thirteen. So the six thirteen don't exhaust all of the things that are required. Um, it's, it's a, as I say, it's a technical and it's, it's disputed in some, what the particular criteria are for counting the six thirteen. In the Sefer Mitzvah, the Rambam has fourteen principles of introduction explaining why he counted the way he counted and why he disagrees with the prior counts, which he thinks are mistaken because they used wrong principles. So it's a very technical study. What's the Roman number again? He also gets two principles to a I'm not understanding you. Uh, Roman also gets two principles to 613? No, 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 no. Again, again. There's a number 613. That goes all the way back. There's 613 commandments somehow. But then there are principles by which you count the 613. How you find it, what things to count, what things not to count. He has 14 uh, uh, how shall I put, what word shall I use now? 14 uh, <coughs> methods, 14 statements of method of how you count the 613. So that he starts his, his safer with those 14 and he tells you Count this, don't count that, count this as two, don't count it as one, and so forth and so on. And he disagrees with prior people who had their account of 613, who used different principles, and he said, he disagrees with their principles, he tells you his principles. So, uh, but everybody has the same number, 613. The Gemara says it. Yeah. Where did the 613 come from? Oh, you said you said the Gemara. The Gemara, yeah. It just said, yeah. It says, Torah Tivalana Moshe. Torah is 611, and it says, Moses commanded us uh, 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 611, but two we heard from the Kodesh Baruch, that's 613. What are the two? Uh, uh, the existence of God and the prohibition against the Vodah Zarah. The Gemara Makos. Okay, there are five prohibitions against the Vodah Zarah. Okay, all this stuff is discussed and calculated out, and, uh, but that's, that's what the Gemara says there. Yeah. Well, the first thing to know is that a Baruch judges people in a realistic way. So, um, if a person had no access to the truth and was lied to and ended up with wrong beliefs, he's not going to be held responsible for that and he's not going to be penalized for that. Um, I'll give you two examples of this. I think it was the Briskarab who commented on the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah's a prophet and God says to him, go to Ninveh and prophesy. And Jonah says, no, thank you. I'm going to Tarshish. I'm going someplace else. I'm not doing it. He gets on a ship, and the ship sets sail. And of course, there's a gigantic storm threatening to 
uh, swamp the ship. And uh, the sailors cast lots to find out who's responsible for it. And lots fall on Jonah. <coughs> and um, they throw him overboard. And indeed, the, the, the storm abates. And they sail on smoothly to port. So, as I said, I think it's the Biscuit of asks, let's, let's figure this out. Jonah's a prophet. He was told to do something, and he, and he disobeyed. Well, that's bad. And he's being punished. Okay, he deserves it. Who are the sailors? The verses are clear. Each one called out to his own gods, plural. They're all idol worshippers. Polytheists. They get fair weather, friendly, friendly winds, smooth sailing. They get to port. Let's say Jonah's doing something wrong. Okay, okay. But can you compare it with idol worship? How come Jonah is punished with a gigantic storm which threatens to kill everybody? And when he's off the boat, the boat sails on comfortably to port. So he said, what do you expect from them? Their whole culture is idol worshipers. You expect every one of them to be Abraham, to stand up against his whole culture? So what he's doing is wrong, but he doesn't have much responsibility or liability for doing the wrong thing because of the culture that he's living in. I'll give you another example. Rav Desta talks about this. Imagine, today you don't have to imagine, imagine a community of people who are dedicated to something that's evil. And they teach that it's good. They bring up children thinking that it's good. And uh, the child has no access to any other information. Actually, the Rambam talks about this also. No access in the, in the the Nebuchadnezzar Yosef would agree to this extreme uh, 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 description also. There's no access to the information. Then says Rav Dessler, when he does what they tell him to do, he has no free will. Let's take theft. Theft is supposed to be a logical mitzvah. You're supposed to, be able to figure out for yourself that theft is wrong. Still, he has no free, no free will and no responsibility because you can only figure out what's logical if your mind isn't polluted, if your mind isn't twisted by prejudice and illogic. So, if you live in such a community, your mind is twisted by prejudice and illogic, and it's impossible for you to come to the right conclusion. So then even something that's logical and rational, you won't be held responsible for and you won't be penalized for. So I think that, the, you know, Ain't because Roho Baba Truni and Mabriosa, because Roho does not come with prejudice and unjust claims against his creatures. Um, if you live in an environment where there's a variety of views, this is not according to Rebbe Lachon of Asuman, if you live in an environment with a variety of views and you are aware that some of the people who believe differently from you are intelligent and... Um, uh, responsible and so forth and so on. And abstractly, if they're right, boy, what I'm doing is really wrong. What I'm doing is very, very uh, in incorrect. But you don't bother to examine what they say and think about what they're talking about. So then you could be held responsible for prejudice because for your health you would do it. And for your money, you would do it. And for your politics, you would do it. But for God, you won't do it. Yet then that makes you responsible for your failure because you're not consistent. You're not applying consistent principles, and that means you're prejudiced in some way. That's another way to be held responsible. But if it really is beyond your ability. It's, it's, I mean, I grew up as a Reformed Jew, and uh, everyone in my environment thought that serious adherence to the Jewish tradition was stupid dumb, uh, ignorant, prejudiced, superstitious. So was I supposed to make an investigation to see whether everybody in my environment was wrong? We had one boy here from Pittsburgh, and he went to uh, twice a week afternoon one-hour Judaism classes. Um, and one uh, class the teacher brought in a woman who she said was orthodox and they told the students they could ask her questions. So this student said to her, uh, I heard that orthodox Jews put white 
strings on their, the corners of their garments. What's that? I said, oh, yes. The Torah does talk about that. It says to put, if you have a four-cornered garment, if you have white strings on the, on the ends of the corners, no one does that anymore. That's what she told him. No one does it anymore. What should he do? Investigate whether she's right? He's coming from a conservative background. Nobody in his circles does it. She's brought it in and labeled as orthodox. He asked her, I heard the orthodox do it. She said, not true, nobody does it anymore. Should he doubt her? How much are you asking from a person? There's no inconsistency in his environment. Even the Mukha Yosef, who was a, the Rambam says, even in an inconsistent environment, if your family brought you up a certain way and you trusted them, you can't be held responsible for not making an investigation. Mukha Yosef is more strict than that. But many people are brought up in, in, in environments. Today, <laughs> many Americans are brought up in controlled environments because they have the media and the AI prompts to the media that they agree with, and it's all fed to them to what they agree with because that's what they press buttons on, and that's all they ever get. They live in a closed circle, the echo chamber. So I say the person should be, uh, and then, of course, what they tell you about other people outside the echo chamber is what I was told about people who had serious feelings about Yiddishkeit. They're, they're just incompetent people. You expect a, a, a 16-year-old to doubt all his parents, his friends, his friends' parents, his professors at 18 who are telling them this with a, you know, with a universal voice. He should doubt them. Why should he doubt them? He's really brainwashed. He's really programmed. Now, of course, Rob is not going to hold that against him. Yeah. So I am on this topic as well. So why does Hashem allow the confusion with the emergence of this new religion, especially with Judaism consisting of such a minority, and even Noahide consisting of such a minority? So why does it seem to be almost... Not seem to be, right? Why is that, why is that allowed? Why is that... Uh, why, does, sorry, wait, 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 why does Hashem permit this? Well, let, let me ask a, 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 a simple, direct, you know, uh, sledgehammer example. Why does God permit murder? Murder. Somebody's killing somebody, ending his life. God has a commitment to free will, and usually, almost always, free will trumps other considerations. Um, not always, but almost always. Um, Maimonides cites another commitment that God has. He doesn't explain it, but he does cite it. Um, someone asked him if there was such an overwhelming um, pressure for idol worship in ancient times, and idol worship is so terrible, why didn't God just give us the strength to to uh, withstand the pressure so he wouldn't do the wrong thing. So Maimonides says, God does not change human nature. And I'll prove it to you. Because the Torah says, when they left Egypt, they could have taken an 11-day journey and gone straight into Israel, but they would have had to face the Philistines, who are fierce warriors. And the Torah itself says, lest they see war and become afraid and go back to Egypt. So therefore, God took them around a long way so they'd be able to enter Israel where they were was weaker opposition. So you could ask the same question, just make them more courageous and let them go in. No, God doesn't do that. That means that he has a commitment to the drama, the, the, the spiritual drama of mankind being worked out under these conditions rather than other conditions. You could ask why, what's special about these conditions. It's an interesting question. But, uh, but the, the point is that God has certain commitments for the way the thing has to operate and they, they define the, the, the type of goal that he's interested in in, um, in, in, and free will uh, is a very high priority on, uh, on, the, on the ladder of, uh, of preferences to how the project has to, has to operate. Free will, free will and, yeah, is, is you know, very high. When you're given information about him, or, giving, or rather giving us information about him, as it revealing himself to not just the Jewish people but as a whole, would that then therefore also oh. preserve free will and also allow for there to be less misinformation. Okay, so then I'll, I'll answer this without going on to somebody else's question because this can, can ramify. Um, the question now is, why do the conditions of the divine revelation of the world vary very substantially from period to period? And you've already given the, the, the answer, basically. The, 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 the nature of divine hiddenness or revelation determines the dynamics of our free will. 
For the people who left Egypt and who heard the revelation at Sinai and lived the 40 years in the wilderness, atheism was not an option. There was no struggle. Maybe Nietzsche is right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't be stupid. Nietzsche is not right. Open your eyes and look at what's going on. Nietzsche is certainly not right. They didn't have to struggle with, with, with atheism. We do. The miracles that happened to the Jewish people, why did everybody become Jewish if, they, if, 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 if those miracles were public miracles? Because everybody had miracles. Every god did miracles, visibly. The rain falling was a miracle. Lightning was a miracle. The overflowing of the Nile was a miracle. Miracles are going on all the time. So your god brought us frogs. That's what he's done lately. OK, very nice. Congratulations. The Nile god has been keeping us the breadbasket of the, of the Middle East for hundreds of years. Let's see if your God will bring frogs every year for hundreds of years. Then we'll talk about this. So the miracles were there, but they didn't have such an effect. If you would have a pillar of fire starting at Washington Heights and make its way down to, 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 to uh, Chinatown, and you know, one, one night down Fifth Avenue, it would be all over. It would be all over. Right? All the competing religions, everything else would be down, dead, you know. <laughs> Stop off in, in, um, in um, uh, Delancey Street and pick up a pickle <laughs> and go on. <laughs> yeah. So these things change the contours of, of free will. In different times, in different places, God wants different types of free will challenges. Now, what the program is in detail, no one has a clue. But once you know there is such a program, and the variations of the free will are part of what's necessary to bring the world to the perfection that's required, then you understand why there are variations. You had a question in the back. If, if God is so committed to free will, then how do we know, first of all, that he's going to interact in the world? Like, why does God interact in the world <coughs> in the first place if he's committed to free will? And then how do we know he's like, even paying attention nowadays? Or I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't get the question at all. You're standing at the Red Sea. There are two mountain ranges. The Egyptians are bearing down on you, and behind you is, a, is, is, a, is the water. And you're frightened to death. And Moses says, don't worry. And you say, listen, I'm from Brooklyn. I worry. Don't tell me not to worry. He said, don't worry. Everything will be fine. Really? Everything will be fine? Yeah, just march into the water. So one jumps, and the others jump, and then the water splits. You're now wondering whether God acts in the world. You still have a serious question. Free will wasn't compromised there. They all had free will, and God acts in the world. What kind of question is that? But I mean, nowadays. Like but now it's a new question. Now it's not the whether God acts in the world. We have a historical record of that. We know that he does. He does sometimes, and not other times. The plagues each took, uh, took a week, and there was three weeks without a plague. How come there were three weeks in between? Maybe God went on vacation. Maybe he went to sleep. Who knows? Who knows? Well, you take the data that you have, and you make the, the most reasonable simplest explanation. He had a reason for waiting. Not that he was cut off. His, his, his communication devices weren't working for three weeks. Had to recharge the batteries. Probably not. Given the, the abilities that he, that he demonstrates, that's not a good ex explanation for why he did what he did. I'd rather have no explanation than that explanation. That doesn't, doesn't fit the facts. Right? You have a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. And you have manna that you eat every morning. I mean, there's a lot going on. And it shows gigantic capabilities. And they're all designed to take care of the Jewish people and to uh, uh, eliminate the pressure of their enemies. So you know something about his, the, this agent's preferences. These, these are things that you can read from the interactions. But none of these th threaten free will. You started off with wondering about free, free will versus God revealing himself in the world. The, the two go hand in hand. There's no, no tension there at all, as far as I can see. You got a question? Sources tell us. Rabbi Yudha Nasi had a committee. He had a group of scholars. He was fabulously wealthy, and he, and he sponsored them. And he discussed each of the uh, development of the mission. He discussed each clause as it went. And they, and they, and they uh, agreed upon how the mission should be formulated. We know exactly how it was done. Yeah. Uh, who, who, Their souls disappear, they can't. 
Okay, I invite you to go back to that Mishnah in the 11th chapter of Sanhedrin, or 12th, depending on which edition you have, and read beyond the first line. The first line says, every Jew has a share in the world to come. The next words are, and these Jews have no share in the world to come. But nobody reads the second line. So every Jew is, means normally under usual conditions, you know, but there are exceptions. So it's just not true. It's just not true. Whether we follow that Mishnah or don't follow that Mishnah is an interesting question. The Gemara later on cites certain authorities who disagreed with the Mishnah. It was permissible to disagree with the Mishnah. The Mishnah did not require that you agree with it. But you're quoting the Mishnah, and you're quoting the first line and not reading the second line. If you're talking about the point of view of the Mishnah, there are Jews who did lose the world to come. Okay, last question, then I have to go. Again, assuming we're past the point of whether, you know, the question of whether this, this occasion is, is permitted or necessary for him to go, assuming he had been told he should or could go, um, should he then make an effort to, quote unquote, make himself scarce as a Jew, or the opposite? Should he go in full garb and, and, and you know, eager to... It will vary from case to case. There's no general rule. Uh, I, I think one way to look at it, it's a complicated question. You have to ask a big authority. I'm not someone who can give you a general. But one, th one way to think about it is I'm planning a course of action. What do I want to be the outcome of that course of action? And if you're talking about publicly identifying yourself as a Jew in a certain place, where? You're going to get hatred. You're going to get vilification. You're going to get uh, social cancellation. You're going to uh, you'll be threatened. You won't be able to speak uh, openly. No one will listen to what you say. So then I would find hard to believe that it was, that it was worthwhile for you to do that. Um, I just saw an article now. Uh, debate in schools, right? So it's interesting. I didn't, they didn't used to have it. They had the judges who, who are going to judge the debates have a, there's some website where they put on their, their principles for judging, right? And nowadays, some of the principles are if you say that X is true, you lose. Immediately, we close down the debate and you're, and you're penalized. Really? You say X is true? Yeah, because we don't permit that. If you're for capitalism or you're for Zionism, or for that, that's it, you lose automatically, no matter what the subject of the debate was about, you say that, you're dead. That's debate. Golly, that sounds to me like no debate. <laughs> you, know, you just shut off. So, so you're going to say, you know, you're going to go there with a the yarmulke? What? I can't see any good consequences coming from it that will outweigh the negative consequences uh, coming from it. So why? You know, why? What if the concern is, what if the question is based on whether or not other people who see there may think, may make judgments based on seeing a Jewish person in such a place? 99.9% or, or .9 will make negative judgments, negative false judgments on the basis of seeing a Jew there. But I'm, I'm not speaking as a post I'm not a post -like, and if you have a concrete case, you should, uh, you should ask. Um, Jews throughout history have hidden their identities. There's nothing wrong with hiding your identity. There's not, not anything wrong of dressing in such a way that someone will make the mistake of thinking that you're not Jewish. You can't say you're not Jewish. That you can't do. But you can dress in such a way that someone will, you know, in the, in, in the Second World War, there were Jews with blue eyes and blonde hair and they were fluent in German, and they just walked around speaking German, and they managed to escape, right? They didn't have to put out scissors and say, you know, go come and kill me. Okay.